embrace, how would you describe the next America? <coughs> I would think the next American Revolution, from the response we've been getting since the book was published, is what the American people are looking for. I think we are in a place at a time in the black world where we where we know that we have to make some very fundamental changes. And that we have a power within us to make those changes. And that if we only name it and begin thinking about the power that we have to create something new, to take humanity to a next stage of revolution, that we can do it. And it will be something that the whole world is looking for, because they're looking for change in this country. It's something that Americans are looking for because we know that the empire is dying. It's something that the I think that all of the world wants us to do that we have so long been exploiting the rest of the world. We have achieved our comforts and conveniences at the expense of the earth and of other people. And that we have to change. And that our change will be a blessing to the world. And I think that's why there's a resonance to that title, The Next American Revolution. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. Not like the old revolution, but like in terms of taking over the state and exercising power over other people or, or increasing the amount of abundance that we have, nuclear abundance, or creating more nuclear reactors. But as something that's the evolution of our humanity, and that the time has come for that, I think people are feeling that. Talk about your history. Talk about where you were born, where your parents were born, and how you wound up in Detroit. Well, my parents came from China in the first 1911. And my mother never learned how to read and write because she was brought up in a little Chinese village where there were no schools for females. And I was born on top of my father's Chinese restaurant. And when I cried, the waiters used to say, just leave her on her little side, she's only a girl baby. And that taught me very early on that we needed changes in this world. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I took it by activism actually to that time. <laughs> but it wasn't until I got a doctorate in philosophy in 1940. And the idea of a woman and a Chinese woman particularly getting a job and a teaching in the university was so outlandish. I mean, the Masons would come out and say, we don't hire Orientals. Then I, I went to Chicago and I found a job for $10 a week in the philosophy library. And I didn't. I wasn't, you know, a lot of people didn't make more than $500 a year in 1940. But it wasn't very much rent still. So I found a place where I could stay rent free in the basement. And the only obstacle was that uh, I had to face down rats in order to get into the basement from the back alley. And that made me very rat conscious. <laughs> <laughs> connections with a group of Chicago people who are struggling against rat infested housing and of course they were black. And that was my first contact with, with the black community. And that brought me into contact with the March on Washington movement led by A. Philip Randolph in 1941. In 1941 the depression had ended for white workers but not for blacks because the defense plans were booming, but they didn't hire blacks. And 
Randolph began to mobilize blacks all over the country to march on Washington. And the FBI was so afraid that that image of blacks marching against racism would go all over the world when he was preparing for, for a war against Hitler that he issued an executive order 8802, banning discrimination in defense plans, and that gave blacks for the first time an opportunity to make a way that to have seniority be in the plan. And I thought, if that's what a movement can do, that's what I'm going to do by that. <laughs> that's how I became a movement activist. And how did you meet Jimmy? <laughs> People are always asking me. I, 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 if you read the, the chapter on Jimmy, someone just asked me about the old day. It starts out when people ask him that question, he grins broadly and says, Grace got me. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> I, you know, it was, it was amazing. Jimmy was born in a small town in America, in Alabama, where there were more pigs than people. <laughs> and, and he learned to write and became a writer because the people in this community didn't read or write. And he became a scribe. And that's what decided him to become a writer. And I think that's, to me, that's what the South represented. That, that's kind of a way, making a way out of no way. To become a writer because others didn't write and you had to write for them. And I was just talking to a, a young woman today, actually, Kim, who you probably say. And she says, you know, there was something about us in the South that we didn't, that we lost when we came north. It was that understanding that we could make a way out of the roadway. And I think that's what's going on in Detroit today. That a city that is so devastating that most people think it's the end of the world. That blacks who have been raised, in, many of them raised in the South, looked at vacant lots that were been abandoned. And where other people saw blight, they saw hope. They saw an opportunity to grow our own food. They saw an opportunity to help young people who were raised in the city and have a quick fix mentality, get a sense of patience. So they set the opportunity to create a whole new way of living. Not only the way that we grew our food and fed ourselves, but in the way that we thought. And, that, and in Detroit, you know, most of the, if you think of Detroit just devastation, you don't understand that there are times when human beings will look at space and see an opportunity to create a new, and that's what's going on in Detroit. I, you know, up to that time, I, we had not made a distinction between rebellion and revolution, and when all hell broke loose in cities all across the country in the 60s. We began to see that we had to go beyond being angry, act angry. We had to go beyond rising up. We had to go begin thinking about what does it mean to create a new society? What are we really struggling for? And how, how do we expand the concepts of democracy beyond what we have? How do we begin creating a participatory democracy? How do we go beyond just jobs? How do we begin reimagining work as a way whereby you not only produce goods and services, but by, what, by you develop skills? And you're not just trying to create abundance, but you're trying to develop community. I mean, the whole idea of reimagining everything, reimagining work, reimagining education, making a paradigm shift in how we think about our relationships with one another. How do we begin being the neighbor back into the hood? <laughs> <laughs> But how do you do that? 
And how do we make the concept of love something that we can say and, and practice without feeling embarrassed? And you know that that, as Sheikh Guevara said, is not something that's ridiculous. When I joined the movement, it was ridiculous to think of love as the purpose of revolution. Amy wanted to just speak more about Malcolm and Martin and what we can learn from them. And I think that the point about love, since love is so central to King's philosophy, is a good starting point. You know, I, I, I said here, and I've often said, that when I encountered Martin's ideas of nonviolence in the 60s, I thought they were kind of naive. And I identified a lot more with Malcolm. But when I saw the violence break out in Detroit, particularly in the wake of the rebellions, I began to wonder whether we could combine Malcolm's militancy with Martin's nonviolence. And then it was amazing after the Martin Luther King holiday was declared during the Reagan years, as a matter of fact. And I began speaking about Martin. I began reading him and understanding how much he understood of the concept of transformation and how much that is the essence of other modern revolution, to transform ourselves as well as institutions, to engage young people in practices by which they can transform themselves at the same time that they transform their surroundings, to think of all our, our culture as something very different from what it is our culture has emphasized things so much at the expense of our humanity. And that, that our, our things have grown and our humanity has shrunk. We need to face that and understand that that's the, the purpose of revolution, that's the process of revolution. And to feel that, and to feel that that's the growth of your soul and that's the growth of your relationships with everybody with your family, with your neighbors, with your people you work with. What is your assessment of these rolling rebellions from the Middle East, like Tunisia and Egypt, to Madison, Wisconsin, to Lansing, Michigan? Well, I think we have a responsibility to carry on what the next American revolution is in order to give them an example of what has to be done. I mean, to get rid of an authoritarian uh, government and leadership, dictatorship, is the only the very beginning. I think that all the problems they have to face, uh, they, um, in a the sense, they're more difficult than ours, because they haven't had the experience we've had, that just happy jobs just developing economically does not solve your life problems. They have a lot to go through. They have a lot of experiences. And we can help them by giving another model a little revolution as well. We have to recognize that what we had in the past came from the fact that we were exploiting the rest of the world. And that that <laughs> empire is dying or dead. And we have to create a new way of caring for each other. What is your assessment of President Obama, Grace? Well, I don't know whether he was able to do more than he has done, but I do know that since he entered the White House, he has not been able to do what we had hoped from him. I think the White House is a trap. I think power is a trap. I think that that's why we have to depend on how the power within us and among us to create the world. You know, uh, 
when Obama was a senator running for president, and he was in the house, in the backyard of a New Jersey home where he was talking to people who was running, um, someone asked him what he would do about the Middle East. And he repeated the story of A. Philip Randolph meeting with FDR and telling FDR about the condition of black people, the condition of working people, and FDR um, listening intently and then saying, I don't disagree with anything you've said, but you'll have to make me do it. That was what Obama repeated to the person who asked him about the Middle East. Do you think it is possible to make Obama do what you feel needs to be done in this country? No, I think people call that, that, that what FDR said and, and hope that there will be protests and demonstrations of a magnitude that will make Obama do what FBI did. But I think that's, that's uh, first of all, I don't think protests is what's been. I think ever since, I, I, I look back to the Battle of Seattle in 1999, we discovered that we cannot get things from this government any longer that we have to do them ourselves. And I think that's when the world goes to fall and again. We can't talk about how the world is necessary, and the world is possible, and we can't think of how we could create it ourselves. It's a very different time. Uh, if we keep on thinking that the protests will make Obama do the things we are thinking outside the time that we are at the clock on the clock of the world. This uh, the in in, in the in the thirties, much of what was, we achieved was achieved because Roosevelt was going to war, and much of the, what we've enjoyed since World War Two has been at the expense of all the people that were killed during that war has been because the, the United States has been the dominant economic force in the world and we no longer are. I, I think that is an awakening we need to take place. And I think we need to recognize it, welcome it, and expand it. And I think that it helps to do that because if if you're frightened or if you only see the negative and you don't see the negative as an opportunity to move for the new positive, you make yourself impossible. I mean, it has a lot to do with what Julian was quoting earlier from Hegel. You know, Hegel was Martin Luther King's favorite philosopher. Most people don't know that. But I think, I, I don't think actually that until toward the end of his life that King really understood dialectics. Even though, but, you know, he was very young. I had I only began to understand it very well myself, I think, as I grew older. Um, I think that the opportunity that the negative creates for us and the challenges it creates for us to think anew, to expand our imagination, to understand how humanity has always has been evolving, not only anatomically, not only physiologically, but in terms of who, what wounds become human beings. That's the basic question of philosophy, by the way. What does it mean to be human? And that's where we are now. We're asking that question and grappling with it. I don't know how many people realize that uh, Martin's most famous speech, the Revolution Valley speech, the anti-Breakfast Island, anti-Vietnam was speech, only took place because of his disappointment, not, not disappointment, the challenge by the rebellion in Watson in 1965. In 1965, King was in the White House signing, celebrating the signing of the Rose and White Act, which had been won through the struggle in Selma. And 
all hell broke loose with Watts. And King went to Watts, and the young people there, he found had never heard of him. And they were feeling very excited because they, by rioting, by rising up, they had scared the hell out of the authorities. And they asked them why they should be nonviolent in, in this country when the United States is so violent overseas. And that shook him up. You know, he could have become disappointed. He could have become despairing. He could have given up hope. But that experience made him think for me. And I think that's how we have to deal with reality. That's how we have to struggle over and over again as we go out and do things. They don't always work. Or they work so well that you split. I mean, someone goes one way and some others go another way. But every life is all like that. I mean, it's, it's one struggle after another and learning from each one. What do you think of what will happen to unions now with this hyper focus of Scott Walker of all of these governors, Republican but also Democratic right here in New York? Well, I think the unions will have to change. I think that the, the whole idea that you can only that you have to defend jobs at a time when jobs are indefensible, when they're shrinking, is a incorrect premise for building organization. Yes. I think unions have the potential, and I hope to help them do that. I we're trying to do that in Detroit. They, I think we're at a stage in human history where we have to reimagine what work is for, what the essence of work is. That we have thought too much, except the idea that labor, which is a very recent development, only a few hundred years old, that labor, the people have always labored for pain. That only began with capitalism a few hundred years ago. Before that, people worked to produce goods and resources to work together with other people, to develop skills, not by, to get paid by the hour. And we know we have come to the end of that. Mm -hmm. And we've got to see, we, we imagine work. We're organizing a conference in the fall, which we are calling reimagining work. And we're still trying to think about that. You know, I believe that we are going to accept that despite the huge abundance that mass production has created, it has done that at the expense of our humanity. As Marx said, the pavement higher or lower, the fragmentation of the human being has taken place with mass production. And as Gandhi said, that if you have mass production, we will end up at the point where we get to distinguish between our needs and our wants. And that's where we are. We have reached the point where we have to think, face with sober senses, as Mark said, our conditions of life and our relations with our kind. Well, I would love this. I love the thing that I say very often. <coughs> And I'd like to leave with you is that despite the attempts of this power structure to commodify us and all our human relations, we must embrace the conviction that we have the power within us to create the world anew. Mm -hmm.